Good morning, good to see all of you. It really is a good packed house again at 1030. Even when the kids are leaving, that's a great sign because it shows that the 7 o'clock sunrise service, which you didn't come to, and you missed a great breakfast, by the way. No, I'm just kind of poking at you a little bit. It was packed upstairs, probably 200 people there up in our student center. But I'm glad we cleared the seats out. We needed them at 8.30 and at 10.30. So thanks for just uh, being here and worshiping together and inviting folks, folks around you. Hey, do me a strange favor for a moment, okay? I want to ask you to do something you've never done before. But today, right at this moment, miles away in Nevada, there are two couples who moved there several months ago from here. And it's a long story, but between when they moved and now, they're, they've gathered like 20-something people in their home, and they they watch our services. So there's a camera. I'm not sure where it is. It's... Right there. Can you just kind of look back? Our communications director is there, Tanner. But look back. Just wave. And Keith and Nikki and Mike and those guys. And a shout out to the folks there in Nevada. Thanks for joining us here at the service. It's 8.30 there. 10.30 here. Um, so we're just glad to have them join in. So you never know who's listening and who's watching, do you? So hope you had a good holy week, did you? Did you have some time to intentionally reflect and think back over what God has done for us. You know, centuries ago, this week, we remember, I mean, that's kind of the time of the year when we remember those specific events that he went through. I so appreciate our teams and the very, very good Good Friday service that we had this week and just some very thought-provoking songs and times to worship. I trust you've taken time to read extra, to pray, to fast, And so that today will kind of culminate all that we've been thinking about this week. Really glad you're here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is where we're going to focus our time today. It's the final message in a simple two-part series called This Incomparable Gospel. Last week we looked at what it is that we preach and believe. And in a nutshell, we define that as simply... The gospel, which is the person of Christ, and because he's come, all can be changed. It's not hard to understand, and that's laid out for us in the first 11 verses. This is what we believe, and this is what we preach, Christ. I want to address today, though, why do we do that? And I believe this is really the unfolding of the rest of the chapter. Now, I want you to be aware of something. I'm only going to focus on the final eight or nine verses in this chapter. But what Paul does in this chapter is he kind of begins to march the readers up the mountain, so to speak. We'll call it the gospel mountain. He walks them up this mountain and he's going to bring them to the peak to what I'd even say is a volcano. This one's not dangerous. It's lava and molten rock won't kill you, okay? But we're going to kind of trek up this mountain and see this wonderful explosion that occurs between about 50 and 58 in which we see just the incredible result and impact of the resurrection. Because, watch this, in this chapter, it does begin with the gospel, and there is a good set of verses about resurrection in general in the middle, but he ends with this, with this um, mention or this understanding, explanation of what happens when Christ comes. The end of time. So so watch this, guys. What we have here in this chapter is really an overview of the unbreakable chain that all of God's children are on. From gospel to glory, all right? Part of that is the end times when we're changed and we enter into God's, now watch this word, uh, consummated kingdom once and for all. Now don't you say the word with me. Say it consummate. It's a big word. It just simply means final and in full. We might even use the words like visible and and all here. The Lord's Prayer says that we're to pray that your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. The idea being that we are consistently praying even now for Christ to return so that his kingdom will be here in its fullest, most visible form. The theological word for that is called the consummated kingdom. Say it again. Consummated. We say that in contrast to what we call the inaugurated kingdom. Say the word inaugurated. Which means that at Christ's first coming, 
He brought the kingdom. Did he bring it in its fullest visible expression? No. Sin still remains. Look around. Amen? It's still here. We struggle. We have bodies that are perishable. They're corruptible. They're natural. They die. We serve the Lord, but we serve him often in weakness. We can't uh, serve him without taking a break. We get tired. We have to eat. Our bodies wear out. People die. But, but did Jesus bring the kingdom? Yes. He said that. The kingdom of God is near you. So here's what we know, know theologically. In this journey from gospel to glory that Paul is laying out in 1 Corinthians 15, there is a sense in which there's an inaugurated kingdom that we're part of. Say the word inaugurated. inaugurated. It's here in one sense, but it's not fully here yet. Say the word consummated. consummated. Now watch this. It is this consummated kingdom, the time in which Christ's kingdom at his coming is fully viable and visible on the earth that he discusses in the end of chapter 15. That's why chapter 15 is more than just a, a, an understanding of the gospel and of the resurrection. It's an understanding of the unbreakable chain that every child of God is on from gospel to glory. For you and I to experience this end time consummated kingdom that will be on the earth when Christ comes, something has to change in us. You know why? Because you can't enter that kingdom where Christ will be fully present, God will be reigning, there will be no sin, no death. You can't enter that in that body because you have a body of death. Does that make sense? It's perishable, it's corruptible, it's natural. That's going to require a different kind of body. And so to get us ready for this ultimate consummated kingdom, something God's got to do something in us. On what basis will God make that change? That's the question I ask you. On what basis will God make that change that enables us to fully experience and enjoy the consummated kingdom, enjoying God forever, eternally, without any hindrance and no sin? I submit to you, it is the resurrection of Christ that empowers all of that change that's about to happen. That's what Paul proves in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, let me make this plainly current to you. Because that was four minutes of theology for those of you who are thinking, man, that, that's, that's pretty heavy on Easter. Does the resurrection have that, is that, is it have that much of an impact? Is that what's really going on? Wow, that's where we're headed? Yes. But here's how it plays out. It's that truth that affects the moment you lean over the hospital bed. You lean over the hospice bed. You're at the casket, the graveside, and you're saying goodbye to someone you love who's a believer, and you can say these words, I'll see you again. My mom said those words just last Sunday to her sister. They were coming back from Cleveland, Georgia. I'd gotten word from my dad that things had taken a turn for the worse for my aunt. So I called. My mom answered the phone. She's weepy, emotional, understandably so. She had just been to her sister's bedside. And... She was expecting to go and see her sister and maybe things would be okay and she would be maybe headed towards rehab. Instead, she was headed towards heaven. The doctor called him in and said, there's nothing more we can do. You need to say your goodbyes. And so my mom leaned over that hospital bed and to who I know as my Aunt Laverne, she says, through tears, Laverne, I'll see you again. This is not the end. That's why Sandy Hickson, who said goodbye to her mother, Wednesday night, can, even through tears and pain, say with confidence, Mom, <laughs> this is not the end. It's why some of you have, you've buried friends, family members. What? Now watch this. What gives you the right to make such an absurd statement that this is not the end? Who are we to have the confidence that uh, there's more to this life, there's something after this life? Who do we think we are, right? I'll tell you. We are those who believe that because Christ arose, we will rise too. 
That's what's going. I see Mia out there. I see other folks who've been to funerals this year. I think the Day family, they were at our 7 o'clock service. As I thought about the number of families in our church this year who've really gone through difficult, deep waters, I knew right then why God directed me to this chapter months ago. In fact, I have not spoken a single Easter in this church on anything but Christ's resurrection solely. Now, that's not a negative. Can we just agree on that, first of all? That's a weighty, deep subject. But I kept reading this chapter, and most of this chapter is about our resurrection. Did you know that? It is. Verses 12 through about 49 are all about how we will rise. The, the debate in Corinth at this point was not that Christ didn't rise. Read through those verses. They're that we're not going to rise. And Paul's saying, guys, if, if you don't think we're going to rise from the dead, then quit preaching that Christ rose from the dead because his point is this. Logically, if Christ arose and you're in him, you'll rise too. And then again in about verse 35, he talks about what that looks like. It looks just like Christ did. You'll have a glorified body as well. You'll have an actual body that, that will serve the Lord. And though it's physical and though it's real, it's not natural. It's going to be immortal. It won't corrupt or decay. Praise God for that day, amen. Have you seen the mirror lately? Aren't you glad for that day when you'll get a new body? So Paul's laying the groundwork. He says, guys, here's the gospel, what we believe. It ends in glory, but the proof that you will share bodily in a glorified way with Christ and others on that day is this fact. Christ arose from the grave. He is the first fruits, and you will follow suit. So today I bring you good news. Rooted in Christ's resurrection, yes. It's this news that this is not the end. There is more to this life. It's the next life, and that's the best life. Amen? It's where we're headed. The consummated end-time kingdom of the Son of God. He talks about that in this chapter as well, by the way. Look at verse 50 where he mentions it a second time. Let's unpack these verses that kind of are the peak of the mountain trek. The, the volcanic eruption, if we would, of this, in, this lengthy and logical chapter about resurrection in general, about the gospel trek we're on. He says, I tell you, brothers, 1 Corinthians 15, 50, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now, what does that mean? We know by implication he must mean the consummated, end time, fully visible kingdom because you're in the kingdom if you're a believer, right? The answer to that is yes. So what does it mean when he says you can't inherit it? If you're in it, that doesn't seem like it's true. What he's saying is when the kingdom of God comes in its full visible form on the earth, you can look back to verse 24 to see this mentioned. Look back there at 15, 23, 24. When Christ comes, he will then hand the kingdom to God the Father, do you see that? He's speaking here of that consummated kingdom. What he's saying is, at that moment, you can't go into that kingdom in your natural body. It doesn't mean that you can't be a part of it as a human. We can. We can, be, we can believe in Christ, the gospel. He brings us into his family. But on the, on the last day when Jesus comes and the kingdom's fully visible, Human bodies are not going to be a part of that. It'll take something different. A change has to happen because that's an eternal, immortal kingdom. We have fleshly, mortal bodies, right? So Paul's now saying, how is God going to arrange all this? He says again, the perishable cannot inherit the imperishable. So he says, I will tell you a mystery. Now, the vol volcano is starting to, to uh, rumble. Listen to this. This is good. We shall not all sleep. It's a euphemism for die. And I think what's inherent here is this. Paul's saying not everyone's going to die before Christ comes. Now, did Paul die? Yes. Did he think he would die? I don't think so. Did you know that? I think Paul was so anxious and looking forward to Christ returning. He includes himself in this group of folks who aren't going to die. That's the attitude I want to have. Man, I want Christ to come tomorrow. Did you know that? Because, man, I look forward to the consummated kingdom when there's no more death or sorrow or tears. I do look forward to that. I look forward to a new body for sure. Amen? Uh, be quiet, okay? It's not. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Don't say amen to that, right? So I'm looking forward to this. Paul's saying not everyone's going to die, but we shall all be changed. That's verse 51. Do you see that? 
And look at the end of 52. Here's the next phrase I want you to see. Again, he repeats himself, we shall be changed. What's the emphatic point Paul is making? Everyone's going to be changed. When the kingdom comes, all believers will be changed. That's how they inherit the consummated kingdom. The point he makes in 51 is this. Not everyone's going to die who is changed. And in 52, he makes this point. Even if you do die, you'll be raised again. Do you see that in 52? So whether you die and are changed or whether you're alive when he comes and are changed, what's the common denominator? All believers are changed. Man, I can't wait for that day. That'll be awesome. Now, when and how will that occur? He explains that in these verses. Look what he says, verse 51. We shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. He gives some, some, uh, some surrounding factors for Christ's coming. Now, the Christ's coming is not explicitly said in this text. You're right. It's mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 4. I think it's an understood theological fact that this is referring to Christ's coming based on other scriptures. The trumpet, the twink of an eye. But when Christ comes, that's when the dead are raised and those who are alive are caught up together again um, with those dead. They're changed. And that's when verse 53 happens. The perishable body puts on the imperishable. The mortal puts on the immortal. That happens when Christ comes, the trumpet sounds, and it happens, according to this text, in an indivisible moment of time. Now watch me here. The word there for in the twinkling, it's generally understood to be the, the, the word that means indivisible. In other words, you, it's something so small you can't divide it. That's how quickly he's going to take your current tent, that body you're wearing by which we know you, He's going to take that, he'll dismantle it, and he'll give you a brand new body just that quick. I mean, wouldn't that be awesome? When we spend hours trying to make this old body look decent, he's going to give us a brand new glorified one that will never decay in an amount of time you cannot even divide. That's powerful. That's God. Now, let me pause here and say, I think personally, this is what happened to Christ in the tomb. Because the point he's making in this long and lengthy chapter about resurrection in general is that as Christ arose, so we will as well in order to enjoy the consummated kingdom. I believe that in the tomb, Christ's mortal body was there, wrapped in those grave clothes, somewhat cocoon-like, the headpiece, the napkin. And then we read in the narratives that at some point, the grave clothes were still there, but they were just almost deflated, like, like... they, they weren't unraveled and messed up. And you find that the, the, the napkin, the, the facial cloth was folded neatly. So, so how did that happen? Here's what I think. I think since Christ is the first fruits, that when God said, it's done, and he instantaneously, in an amount of time that you can't even divide, changed Christ's human body that was mortal and immediately gave him a glorified body. And it just... No longer was bound by grave clothes. And those grave clothes just kind of went. And in that glorified body, he perhaps took that facial cloth and folded it up. Set it aside. Walked out of that tomb. By the way, the stone couldn't keep him in. Amen. That's not why the stone was there to begin with, first of all. The stone was there to keep out people from getting him. But he arose, walked through the stones appeared to disciples, was able to instantaneously transport from the road to Emmaus to the upper room, walk through walls. He didn't need food to survive. You talk about an awesome body, amen? That's what's coming for us in the consummated eternal state, the kingdom of God when it fully and finally arrives. That's the kind of change your body's headed for as well. And I can't wait for that day. That's what's going to happen in that indivisible amount of time. And look what 54 says. Let's keep reading. He says, At this moment, the coming of Christ, when this occurs, when the perishable puts on imperishable, when the mortal puts on immortality, then, now don't miss this church, then, not, not before Christ's coming, but when he comes and we're changed, then shall come to pass the saying that is written out. Now, you've got to get this. 
what the author here is saying, what Paul is saying is that something has been written. There's something that has been testified and prophesied that is yet to be fully in force. But when Christ comes and we are changed, then it will be fully in effect. That's what he's saying, right? What is it that's, that will be fully in effect but has already been promised? Here's what he tells us. That death is swallowed up in victory. Now, when I, when I, when I read that, I'm left with this uh, incredible relaxing feeling that, that I don't have to pretend that it doesn't hurt. The author tells me that when we're changed and Christ comes, then what has been promised will come to pass. So I'm not doubting it's going to happen. But watch this, church. Has death fully been swallowed up yet? The answer is no. Has Christ won every victory so that that will occur? The answer is yes. But we still live in the inaugurated, say inaugurated? Inaugurated kingdom where there still is death and sin. But when Christ comes, death will be no more. This is a quote from Isaiah 25, Hosea as well. He says, God will wipe away tears from their eyes. He's speaking of the the consummated kingdom. And when that occurs, guess what? There at that point and that moment, there will be no more death. Until then, we do have to deal with death. But I don't deal with death with a hope that, well, I hope God can take care of it. He already has at the cross and at the grave. Amen? Amen. And it'll be fully realized when he comes. And in this intervening time, this intermediate state, we'll call it. Guess what? We live with the promise and the hope that he has already promised us victory. He'll deliver when he comes. And here's how I kind of see it. God's taken aim at death. He's pulled the trigger. The bullet's on the way. There's no doubt he's right on target. And the bullet will land when he comes. Does that make sense? So if you're thinking, well, is God really going to do it? Oh, he's already taken aim. He's spot on. and He's even pulled the trigger. He's got death covered. And when Christ comes, then will come to pass the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. It's almost as if God, and pardon the image here, is looking at death with his mouth wide open like, you know what? I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you. And he'll put his jaws over death and totally swallow it up when Jesus comes. That's what's coming. So we say, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your thing? The answer to the question is, it's in the here and now. It's not in the consummated kingdom. It's not later. There is no death there. Hallelujah. But where is the thing of death? It's now. It's temporary. It's in the, inner, it's in the immediate. And does it hurt? Yes. I look around the room. I see people. I know you have some pain from loss you've had this year. Tragedy. Death has a sting, but it does not carry a fatal blow if you're in Christ. He talks about where death gets that sting from. It's sin. Where does sin get its power? It's the law. All of these things are wrapped up in the current situation that sometimes cause us to feel the weight of, of this current situation. But thanks be to God, verse 57 says, who gives us the victory. What is the victory? I think it's a direct reference to verse 52, where it says the dead will be raised imperishable. Your victory that you will not stay in the ground is promised. Why? Because of what God has done through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a clear reference to Christ's resurrection. It's the bulk of the conversation between 12 and 49. Here's the point, church. Christ arose. When he comes, all of that resurrection power will be released and unleashed. It'll change your body just like God changed his. That victory that you'll be raised is rooted in the fact that Christ was raised. His resurrection is the guarantee that you and I have one as well. That's what's going on here. So if you think this life is the end, if you haven't seen anything yet, what's to come in the consummated kingdom of God, 
that will not be inherited by flesh and blood, but blood, but instead by a changed group of people with glorified bodies. Wow, that is going to be glorious, unhindered, eternal fellowship with God. That's what's on the horizon. And every bit of that is empowered and made possible by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what do we do in the meantime? Verse 58. So my beloved brothers, therefore you be steadfast, immovable. These words sound like the very first part of the chapter, don't they? In other words, have your feet set on the gospel. And you should be always be abounding in the work of the Lord. Because you know that you're lo- in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Now, you may think those are odd words that go together. Abounding seems to be something moving and going and growing. And yet he says to be immovable. How can you be both of those, you know? Well, it means to be persevering. And yet at the same time, the word abounding here means to be overflowing. To like be gushing out with joy. So you're steadfast. You're planted on the gospel, and on this gospel track that's headed to glory, you have an insatiable source of joy because you know what's coming. And you know this, that because Christ arose, I'll arise. And he got a new body, I'm going to get a new body. And whether I die or see it when I'm living, it's guaranteed because Christ arose, I'll arise. Thanks be to God for this victory. And so in the meantime... I'm going to be steadfast in the gospel. I'm not going to budge because I know that my labor is not in vain. When's the last time we saw the word vain in this chapter? Do you recall? In the first few verses when Paul said, you know, hold on to the gospel. Stay committed to it. Otherwise, you believed in vain. Here he's saying, rest assured, Christ's resurrection means that you won't get to the end and think, oh, this was all a joke. It's not going to happen. The resurrection is the guarantee, the proof positive. At the end of the, of the unbreakable chain of the gospel, our trek, so to speak, when we get to the consummated kingdom, God's going to say, hey, I was playing hide and seek with you. It's not going to happen. Man, God's going to say, welcome to the kingdom, and you'll serve the Lord there, just as you have here. But watch this, church. Watch this. There, you, you won't get tired You won't need anything to eat. You you won't need sleep. Man, some of you are already grinning. You're like, man, that's what I'm looking for. (laughs) Some of these moms with young children, you're like, sleep? What is that anyway, right? (laughs) I mean, all the things that your body, which is corruptible and perishable now, which it needs to survive so you can serve God, guess what? (laughs) You won't need any of that in the new consummated kingdom, Revelation 21, where there's no more death. You won't need any of that. You will serve God and enjoy Him forever, endlessly, eternally, without any hindrance at all. And why can I say that to you? What gives me the right to promise you that, to proclaim that? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you see how the resurrection affects everything that we do? It provides Sandy and Larry the hope as they say goodbye to her mother. It provides my mom the confidence as she says goodbye to her sister. It gives Tim, I see him back there with Denise, as they worked with his mother this week in some really up and down situations to approach that situation in the right way. Other folks here, this is all rooted and guaranteed by Christ's resurrection, which is why I say to you, listen very carefully, the glory of the resurrection, the glory of the gospel is that Christ's resurrection guarantees that at his return, we will rise too. Not sooner than that, but when he returns, all those who have died will rise, all those who are living will meet him in the air, and we'll all be changed. That proves it's not futile in the meantime, so let's keep serving the Lord, let's keep abounding in our work. His resurrection's proof positive. The best is yet to come. And that, that brings Easter into just a beautiful focus, doesn't it? It it takes it from just a past event to celebrate, like, yeah, we remember something that happened a long time ago and sing a few songs, to where it's like an event that has ramifications every single day in all kinds of situations, all the way to the very end. Because what God will do when Christ comes 
is hinged to and rooted in the resurrection of Christ. All the power that he used to raise Christ from the dead, he'll use to change your bodies too. Man, I can't wait for that day. This is incredibly encouraging Easter news, isn't it? Now, you may think, well, we should share this kind of news more often. I agree. Guess what? Jesus Christ has been sharing this kind of news uh, since he was alive on the earth. In fact, I, I thought it was kind of interesting. As I thought about how this message about resurrection, and it has a good bit of end times information in it. It's not exactly your typical Easter narrative message, you know. I thought, how's this going to go over? But I knew God had led us in this way. I, I, I'm kind of aware of some people needs in our congregation. And, and just the confidence that this is not the end. As you lay people in the ground, as you bury a, a mom or a dad or a sister or a, a child, that this is not the end. Paul is, is, is guaranteeing that Christ's resurrection is what that's built on. I thought, how, how is this going to settle? Then I realized this is exactly how Jesus talked to his best friend. Do you know that? Jesus talked about end times and resurrection stuff to his best friends when they were in, a, in the middle of their own sorrow. Their names were Mary and Martha. And their brother's name was Lazarus. In fact, if you were to ask my opinion, I would say Lazarus was Jesus' best friend. you know that? We don't know how often he was with him. We know that Jesus stayed in Bethany a good bit. In fact, he stayed there in his last six days. That's where he stayed. He'd go to Jerusalem that day and come back. Go to Jerusalem and come back. Up until Thursday, of course. But Bethany is where he stayed most of the time. It's Lazarus of whom we know that that he's the only one in the Bible that we know about where Jesus is said to have wept at his funeral. Now, did Jesus cry other times? I think he did. But did he um, uh, cry at funerals? We don't know, except in this one case, it just says that Jesus wept. Lazarus was very close to him. The band's going to gather, and we're going to bring this to a kind of a close. I want you to listen very carefully. When Jesus wept and he saw Mary and Martha, he talked about future kingdom stuff but he was so amazing in that he personalized it and said it's really not only about that day but he said I am the one who makes that day possible here's how he said it to him. I'll just read you the verses okay in fact I'll read a few of them I'll have you stand and read with me in a moment here's the encouragement Jesus gave someone who was in sorrow look how much about end times is in this here's what Jesus said now when Jesus came he found that Lazarus had been already in the tomb four days Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Here's a tragedy, a funeral situation. What does it say next? When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. And so Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God... God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will, say it with me, rise again. It's resurrection, isn't it? He's pointing her to end times, last days, consummation of the kingdom. Your brother's going to rise again. I think she starts thinking long term as well. Like, I know that's an eventual fact. So she says to him, I know he'll rise again in the, in the resurrection on the last day. Now stand with me, would you? And look how Jesus personalizes this. Look how he makes it all about who he is. And I think even foretelling what he's going to do. Here's how he encouraged his best friends. Read with me. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. He encouraged them by personifying what resurrection was and saying, You believe in me? Then... That's the guarantee that when I rise and return, you will rise as well. And then he asked, do you believe this? And I'd be a fool this morning if I didn't end this by asking you the same thing. 
Do you believe this? Do you believe there's a day coming when Christ will return to earth to judge the living and the dead? He will establish his once and for all kingdom in full visible form. The what? The consummated kingdom. Every person created will answer to this one who's returning. And the only answer that will avail anything in the sight of God will be this. I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. I believe He's the resurrection and the life. Have you taken your stand on the gospel, who Jesus is, what He's done for us, so that when this day comes, you'll be changed. You'll see those who've gone before you, and you'll enter the kingdom not with perishable corruption. You can't anyway, but you'll be changed. If not, this morning, I would just ask you, right where you're standing, would you say, Heavenly Father, based on the person and work of Jesus Christ, save me today. I repent of my sin. I turn from all that I've trusted, and I turn only to Christ to save me. And God will, because He is a saving God, keep His word and save you from hell unto Himself. We're going to sing now some songs that will actually depict this perfectly. They're going to show you the gospel journey we're on, from gospel to glory, this unbreakable chain. I just want to invite you, man. Let your heart pour out praise to God. No communion this morning. We had communion on Good Friday. Let's just worship the Lord. And as we sing these songs and your heart agrees, man, sing with passion. If you're not sure you're a Christian, you come upon words that, that, that are prayers that would say, God, save me. Man, I would encourage you, even in the song, ask God right then to save you. And let's pray that God will do what only he can do. Amen. Save sinners by the gospel and unto himself for eternity. Can I pray with you? Heavenly Father, Easter is a remarkable um, time. And often we do remember what happened. And I think unintentionally, we sometimes revisit the past without understanding all the ways it connects to our present and future. But every bit of our future enjoyment and experience in your consummated kingdom is tied to the fact that you arose. And that guarantees that you will raise the dead, you'll catch up the living, and you will change all who believe so that they can enjoy you forever in your incorruptible eternal kingdom. But I look forward to that day, and I'm so thankful for the previous day when you arose. Truly, you are the first fruits, and we all now follow suit. Church, sing in your hearts to our great God.